Welcome to The Helping Conversation, an exploration and celebration of the practice, art, and science of facilitating trusting, safe, inclusive, and effective helping conversations with others. Defined as any conversation that focuses on supporting a person in the moment and or supporting the overall growth and development of a person, group, or organization, the helping conversation is at the core of that sacred partnership between two or more people or a person and an organization where one has been asked, agrees to, or is empowered to help another. Not only the domain of traditional helping professions, such as counseling or coaching, this podcast will introduce you to individuals such as business owners, leaders, teachers, advisors, entrepreneurs, parents, and others who have successfully and effectively utilized their own unique brand of the helping conversation to support people and organizations in being their best. Recorded at RockVox Recording and Production Studios, Rochester, New York, mouth off at RockVox, rockvox.com. Having enjoyed an almost 40-year career facilitating his own authentic brand of the helping conversation, your host, executive and recovery coach, Keith Greer. Good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to uh, another episode of the Helping Conversation. So glad that you could uh, make the time to join us today uh, and uh, continue with us uh, to be a part of our exploration and celebration of all the kinds of people out there that do something to help another person or a group or an organization. And I am excited about my guest today, who I can say this will embarrass her a bit because I have known her um, since she has been born or was born. And uh, it is, uh, and I have followed her career, and we will uh, talk more about that uh, as uh, she has headed down the road of being a helping person. Uh, so please join me in uh, in uh, sending along a really warm welcome to my guest, Leah Milton. Good morning, Leah. Good morning, Keith. So good to have you uh, is as a part of this conversation. Uh, we've been talking about doing this for a while, so I'm glad we're able to connect. <laughs> Me too. So let me fill everybody in a little bit on who uh, Leah Milton is. Uh, Leah is a coach, an entrepreneur whose life philosophy surrounds building community and empowering others through adventure. She has lived and worked all over the United States of America and Central and South America in the hospitality industry. In 2016, Leah co-founded Hike for Beer, a mission-driven adventure tour company in San Diego, focused on bringing people together through public land preservation and local craft beer education. Leah is a certified professional whole person coach, writer, and consultant on business development and marketing strategy. Leah looks forward to when she can travel again and create impactful adventure coaching trips for groups of motivated individuals. And again, good morning, Leah. <laughs> good morning. <laughs> so I always like to start this conversation with my guests uh, at the beginning. Um, so fill us in a little bit on some of the highlights of how you got to where you are right now in the world of, of coaching and helping others. Yeah, definitely. It has not been a traditional path. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's definitely, it's been interesting. So, you know, I, I, I grew up with two parents for social workers. So I think as much as I may have tried to fight it when I was younger, I think <laughs> helping people is in my blood. <laughs> um, and so that sort of was always instilled in me, um, you know, helping people from when I was a kid to being in high school, always willing to help others. And then I sort of realized once I went to college, I ended up studying psychology, um, changed my major a few times and then realized psychology was what I was interested in. And um, ended up studying abroad uh, in Australia, which my parents, you know, said, could you have really gone any further? <laughs> any away further, from... right, on the face of the earth. <laughs> and I think that was sort of my first experience. A lot of my friends either didn't go abroad or studied a little bit closer. And so that was kind of my first experience where I got asked a lot of questions and um, found myself kind of mentoring and helping others sort of have these uh, incredible experiences. I was able to travel on my own for the first time, stayed in a hostel by myself for the first time where I kept all of my belongings under my pillow. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so that, uh, that was kind of my intro to my love for travel and adventure. And I moved to New York city after college, which is kind of an adventure in itself. Mm -hmm. um, 
And, and again, found myself a lot of times just being asked a lot of questions. And I, I sort of, things kind of started to click at that point of, of kind of, um, you know, I was being asked a lot of questions of how did I get where I was and how did I do this? How did I do that? So I kind of used that as an opportunity to start really helping people. I wanted to be able to share my adventures with, with others. Um, and I also worked in a few nonprofits in New York city too. So that was amazing to do impactful work there. Right. And, um, yeah. And then after that, the adventure that the most recent adventure that has led me where I've been was sort of, I left New York city to travel South America for two years. And that was really kind of what, um, my path was already kind of unique, but then it, it really just went off the charts crazy <laughs> at that point. So, um, traveled for a few years, came back to the States, um, got involved in the beer industry and the outdoors. Um, and that led me to form Hike for Beer to really uh, amplify that helping conversation of helping people get outdoors and embrace their adventure. Um, so that's sort of the the uh, the unique path. And it has, to... <laughs> it has been. It has been. I mentioned when we started that I that I have um, so enjoyed following that path um, <laughs> through through either Facebook or or my relationship with your mom. Um, and it has been uh, it's been a very inspiring path because it has not been your very traditional path, as you said. So you, you mentioned that that you are born of two social workers. Um, and so there might be some of this helping part that is that is in the genes. But I'm always curious with folks. uh Maybe for an example of when you were younger, that that as we look back on it now, we could say there's some of the first evidence that this person was destined to do something helping other human beings. What what might that have been? You know, it's funny. I was thinking about that. And I remember this time in, I think it was sixth grade, and they wanted to sort of have uh, a mix of different kids. They like, they created sort of this classroom that was a blend of all sorts of backgrounds, diverse kids and everything. And they, uh, I remember my parents telling me, my teacher was really excited for me to be in this class because it was going to be an opportunity for me to be around, um, all different sorts of backgrounds of kids of different learning levels and everything. And the teacher was so excited for me to, to be in there, to be able to, um, sort of use my personality and my, um, my my helping characteristics to kind of uh, work with the different students in the class. And so I was probably what 11 or 12. And so that was kind of <laughs> the beginning, the beginning of sort of noticing I was kind of out to, uh, to be a helper. Yeah. Yeah. So, so um, some of that beginning evidence of, of the empathy gene, right. And the connection mm -hmm. gene and being, I always think being curious about other people, right. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Yeah. Awesome. Um, so a, a, as you've you've gone on from there, um, mentors along the way, you know, who are some of the people that you've looked up to uh, that have inspired you uh, as you have uh, followed this this, again, very unique path that you have? Yeah, I think personally, both of my older brothers, um, they have had both unique paths as well. Um, neither of them took a traditional path to get where they are today, but they owe, they both own their own successful businesses. And I think watching them sort of, you know, watching their successes, watching their missteps, watching everything, um, you know, I admire them so much. I think seeing the way that their paths led them to where they are today was so inspiring. Um, they still inspire me. Mm. I talk to both my brothers regularly and um, just kind of and, and looking at who they've inspired too with the work that they do, but they both work in very different industries, but um, you know, one works in landscape design, the other works in music technology, but right. both helping people in, in different ways. So right. my brothers right. for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so when you, so when you start thinking about how you do what you do, I, I'm always very curious just about how people even begin to create relationships with other folks. Cause at the end of the day, I think, I think that's, that's, a, a, that's our superpower as helping people is where we're, 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 we're blessed at, at often and on a very intuitive level, knowing how to create relationships, get that relationship started. So in any of these positions you have been in through your travels in the not-for-profit um, with, with, with your business, which we'll get more into in a little bit, what are some of the things you think about in, in getting that initial relationship started with somebody? I think you mentioned before that empathy, Jean, I think that's something that is inherently 
in me. And it's something that is so necessary when, when starting a relationship and creating a relationship. I think it's a sense of really uh, curiosity leading to empathy mm. as well. You mentioned curiosity also kind of that genuine curiousness to know where somebody came from, why, how they ended up where they're going, where they are now, where they want to go um, and being empathetic to their situation. It's, I think I'm always looking at the lens of, of where they are. You know, I, I, who am I to judge where they're at, you know, where, where it is on the spectrum of life. Right. Um, so I think really just relating to the person and having that empathy of, um, I understand, you know, I, I may not be in your position. I may not ever know what that's like, but, um, I'm empathizing and I, I hear you. And so I think empathy and, and really listening to, to the person as well. Yeah. Yeah. That listening piece is, is, uh, I think we can all agree is in short supply in our world right now of, of people truly listening to other people um, that allows them to walk away feeling that I was truly listened to and honored by this other person. Uh, um, in your not for profit work, because that's a whole universe in and of itself. Um, talk a little bit about that of of uh, of what you brought to that work every day in in trying to uh, help people move their lives forward. Yeah, that was a, a great experience. It was something that um, I got led, you know, I, I graduated college in, in 2008, which at the time, you know, and, and looking back at it, it was a really interesting time to graduate and get into the working world. So it's um, interesting that I ended up in, in the nonprofit world, sort of in that realm in 2008, 2009, kind of when, uh, and in New York City as well, when, when a lot of people were feeling that recession. And so, the ability to uh, work with people to help. Um, I worked for a city park in Manhattan. And so being able to bring my talents for, you know, for empathy and, and that curiosity of, of wanting to meet people and, and discover really um, what was important about this park. Um, and I did a lot of research in my work there about the history of the park, uh, what it meant to other people and really kind of you know, putting that emotional aspect into raising money, creating events. And, and that was my first job out of college, too. I was learning how to be a professional, how to work, how to, um, you know, work with others and manage right. my time. And so doing a lot of learning as well as bringing um, some of those skills I had learned over the years yeah, as well. Yeah. I, I want to highlight something you just said, because I always think this is so important and I, I, you know, I, I'll, I'll be honest, one of one of my motivations to even do this podcast is that I, I do think sometimes that there is a general con kind of conception in the world that us helping people, we just do it because we're naturally caring, compassionate, empathic people, and that people really minimize, I think sometimes, or just don't understand the complexity of what we do and, and, and some of the science and the research behind what we do. And we could just start with simply how to create a relationship with another human being. So I, I love hearing you talk about getting into this position, learning and learning how to be, I always think of it as a professional helper, right? Versus, well, I'm a good person and I listen to my friends and I'm not minimizing that, but it's a whole nother world when, when you are now being paid and wearing your professional helper hat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. And and it was two very different organizations I worked for. I uh, worked for the park and then worked for uh, Gilda's Club in New York. So mm. that was actually a cancer support organization that Gilda Radner and, and Gene Wilder created. And so two totally different uh, ends of the spectrum in terms of, of helping others. And, and it was a working for Gilda's Club really taught me um, kind of how to navigate that the whole situation of working people at work, I mean, with people in different situations. I think that was kind of paramount, um, you know, working with people that had lost uh, loved ones to cancer mm. that were living with loved ones that had cancer. And that really, um, that really working with all the social workers and the therapists at Gilda's club, it, it was, you know, you couldn't just go out and ask people for money and just kind of throw everything at it. You really, there was sort of a, a conversation that needed to be had and there was a way to have it um, in dealing with people that were going through a lot of emotions. Yeah. So. Can you give us the, uh, maybe just a little idea of, of what are some of the specifics of that conversation? Cause I would imagine people would naturally think, well, you're just going out and asking for money and what better thing to ask money for than cancer who can't relate to that. But it sounds like there's much more nuance to that conversation than maybe meets the eye. 
Yeah, definitely. It's really um, about what the organization does. Um, I think, you know, making people aware of, of where, you know, you're asking for, for money for this organization, where is their money going and, you know, creating sort of a space of this is what some of the people that I work with are going through. Um, you know, tell me something about yourself. Why are you interested in this organization? Really getting to know the donors and to right. know the people I was going to be working with. Right. Again, creating that that conversation yeah. of, of empathy and curiosity. Yeah. yeah. I, I, a word just popped into my head as you were talking about that of, of inviting people to tell their story. Right. That what's your story that would create your connection to this organization? And, and then I would imagine, and I know nothing about fundraising, but I would imagine from a fundraising standpoint, helping people dig into their story makes the conversation about the money part a little bit less transactional because now it's, now it's about meaning, right? Of, of mm-hmm. how the, 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 um, the goal of your organization resonates with me. Exactly. Exactly. I loved that. And really just having somebody, you know, we encourage people to, to give a donation for a specific program that they were passionate about, you know, that their name would be attached to, you know, not just their name, but their um, donation, their support would be attached to that specific program, you know, not just a general um, donation, which is also great, but really sort of making that connection and making it a meaningful right. relationship. Right, right. So you leave New York and you, uh, is that when you headed to South America? Uh-huh. All yeah. right. And and so fill us in a little bit on what that experience was like. Um that was the single cra- I I don't want to say craziest thing I've ever done, but it really <laughs> I <laughs> I really, I really empathize with, with my mother looking back now, this was, you know, almost 10, almost 10 years ago and calling her and telling her I had booked a one-way ticket to Chile and I was going to go live in in South America. And, you know, I just, the silence on the other end of the phone was just, you know, spoke volumes. Uh (laughs) Um, You know, I, I think I was, I was naive a little bit in that first trip that I took down there. I, had taken high school Spanish and figured, you know, I'll be fine. I took high school Spanish. I'll be able to go down there and, and meet people easily and, and it'll be great. And it's going to be sunshine and roses. And um, I arrived and the taxi driver started speaking Spanish to me. And I was like a deer in headlights. And I said, okay, this is going to be a long, long few months. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so it, it taught me so much. I, definitely tested my boundaries in mm. those, those first few months. I lived with a roommate who barely spoke English. Um, I did have another roommate living with us that was able to speak English and Spanish. So that gave me a little reprieve. Um, and then I booked an internship with this family in this village in Southern Chile, helping them with their rafting company, their adventure tour company. Um, and the entire family did not speak English. And somehow my application got switched with someone else and they thought I was going to be a girl from Germany that was fluent in Spanish but instead they got an American that was not fluent in Spanish um so for six weeks I lived with this family who did literally spoke no English and so I really that, I mean that was the best my Spanish ever was and probably right. the whole time I traveled just through survival mode right um but talk about a an experience where I was completely out of my element and the helping conversation was just as much for my benefit as it was for, for the people I was meeting along the way. Right. Right. And so in addition, what, were there other activities in addition to this internship that you did while you were down there where you were working with other folks? I was, I was also working. Um, I was taking classes at a Spanish school. So that was sort of my other interaction with, right. with folks that were traveling. Um, and then did a lot of, uh, interacting at the at the internship as well as sort of at the front desk so anyone that came in um that was traveling i would sort of interact with them regardless of what language they spoke i just right. made it work <laughs> right so I, I i'm hearing um i'm hearing personal traits and characteristics that i imagine and we'll we'll, we'll get to it in a, a few minutes as we talk about some of the coaching you're doing now that so must so benefit you as a coach because I, I wrote down here um, your ability to take risks and your ability to just follow your path and your ability to just leap and and figure it out and have the, and have faith that you will figure it out and I'm thinking those have to be such phenomenal helping gifts for the folks that you work with now. 
It really, it is. And it, it's something that I, I think I hadn't thought about until recently, kind of looking back at, at a lot of the decisions that I have made and a lot of the situations that I have put myself in voluntarily. Um, you know, and I think in working with the people that I've worked with in the past and that I work with now, it's really not about me. Again, there's no judgment with any risk that they want to take. And, and I'm not telling somebody to go, you know, on a whim, just go do something and they'll figure it out. But it's, it's, hey, you want to take this risk. And a lot of people around you might be telling you that you're crazy. You know, let's work. Let's work on it. Let's talk yeah. about it. Let's figure it out. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I, I think also, and, and, you know, I know I've, I've found places over the years to share this with you. I know some of the messages that you got through the years from different corners of your world, well-meaning, loving people who were saying, Leah, what the heck are you doing? <laughs> and, and yet, in spite of that, uh, you just, you kept marching to the beat of your own drummer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I definitely had a lot of folks, you know, after I came back from that first trip, I was gone for four months and I came back and there was probably a lot of people that breathed a sigh of relief saying, <laughs> oh, all right, she's got it out of her system. Yeah, Great. Right. Perfect. <laughs> um, but it was, it was just the beginning. It was, it's a thrill that, that I love. And that's my, that's my adventure. That's my journey. Um, right. But Again, I think having that experience allows me to have the space and the openness to, without judgment, talk to other people about their journey and how they want to move forward. Right, right. So uh, take us now to the beginning conversation uh, around this concept of hike for beer. Um, how did that come about? Uh, and, uh, and, and what was involved in, in now moving into the world of entrepreneurship? Yeah, definitely. So it's, uh, I moved to San Diego. Um, and, uh, you know, it is, if you're going to live in San Diego, uh, craft beer is a huge part of, of life there. So that was sort of the world I dove into when I first moved to San Diego. And I happened to be working with a few folks that also loved hiking. Um, I had really discovered a love for hiking when I was in South America, hadn't really done it before. I was a city girl, not into it and then traveled and came back. Um, and so one of my coworkers and I uh, spent all of our free time really just going for a hike. And then we just, after a long, hot hike, we were saying, okay, well, let's go check out, you know, one of these new breweries. And so we would just go have a beer and that was, you know, learn, talk to the brewers and have a fun day. And that was it. And then sort of over time, we found a lot of our friends and family asking us, you know, oh, which hike are you doing? Oh, which brewery is that? And so we sort of doled out, you know, our advice for for these trips. And then one day we were out hiking and said, you know, I think we have something here. You know, it sounds like a lot of people want to do what we're doing. What if we brought all these people together and shared these trips with them instead of just telling them to go out and do it on their own? Um, so that was the beginning of, of the hike for beer idea that sort of developed um, from adventure tour agency into membership community. Right. Um, which is, which is interesting how that kind of morphed. Right. Right. So that means that, that, uh, that people sign up, like kind of sign up to be a, a, a quote unquote member of hike for beer. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So we had, like I said, originally we had, we had planned on it being an adventure tour company for people coming to visit San Diego. We thought right. what a great idea. Um, and then we sort of quickly realized people coming to San Diego for a week didn't really want to go hike. Uh, they wanted to go in the ocean and go surfing. And so <laughs> it ended up, <laughs> um, we were surprised, you know, we got more locals interested and, in, and, um, so it ended up being, you would sign up. Uh, we had a limit on the number of people we would take. We definitely want, didn't want to overwhelm the trails. Um, so we would have people sign up for a hike. We would provide a little bit of trail education, um, and we had only a maximum of 25 people. And so we were really able to form these amazing relationships with members, you know, on these events, during these hikes, um, we would go get a beer afterwards. They would get to meet the brewer. We formed relationships with them. Um, we were basically human connectors for the San Diego network of, right. of hikers and beer lovers. Right, right. So in this, I mean, obviously, there's the entrepreneurship part of it of just taking the risk of starting starting a business. But but that to the side for a moment, where in this process of creating your business, did you find yourself again digging back into those to those helping skills? 
Yeah, definitely. We had, um, and, and this was kind of unexpected. I think I had my entre entrepreneurial hat on when we first started this business. And then I realized really quickly that, um, you know, my, my skills for helping others were really going to just kind of come into play and how Hike for Beer was going to impact people's lives. We had a ton of people that came on Hike for Beer because they had just moved to San Diego and they didn't know anyone. They didn't really know which hikes to go on. A lot of people had never even been on a hike. Um, so I found myself really becoming almost uh, a mentor. Hike for Beer was becoming a mentor to these people. Um, they were able to, I was able to facilitate connections between, you know, oh, this person likes this kind of thing. Oh, this person likes this thing too. Why don't you guys get together um, and sort of facilitating those groups and connections. And that just kind of naturally happened, but quite quickly I realized that that was happening and that Hike for Beer was much more than just sort of uh, a, a venue for for hiking and, and drinking a beer. Right, right. And just, I, I would imagine for many people, just the whole get your body outdoors part um, of having some guidance and some leadership in, in making that happen if that had not been a part of your life up until then. Mm -hmm, exactly. And and we made it, like I said, we had the small groups and so it was great. You know, we had hikers that were climbing, you know, 14ers in the middle of Colorado and we had other people who had never been on a hike before. So it was really cool to see the evolution of people that came on our hikes in the beginning that had never really done much hiking and to see them evolve into climbing these huge peaks later in the year. Right. Um, and, it, and it was really because we were able to have that consistency of getting outside and, and moving around yeah. and being yeah. physically active. And Hike for Beer stayed in business for how long? For uh, three and a half years. That's awesome. Awesome. Yeah. And uh, just what ended up bringing about uh, your decision to move on from that? I think I, I had been in San Diego for about five years. And over uh, the summer of 2019, I made the decision that I wanted to leave San Diego, I wanted to explore uh, more of the U.S. and then eventually continue to travel internationally as well. Uh, at that point, I had also thought about uh, coaching and sort of making that more of a move right. in terms of my career. And so made the decision to leave San Diego. Um, it's it's really incredible the, the people that I still see hiking for beer today. Um, a lot, so many of our community members still go out and hike together. So it really, even though we're not in business anymore, I mean, it, Hike right. for Beer still exists, which is which is great in, in San Diego. Um, but, it, but it was time for me to move on yeah. and sort of use what I had learned uh, with that business and sort of um, figure out what my next move was going to be. It's got to be really cool and rewarding, to, as you just said, to be able to look back and know that, that you played a role in connecting people in, in a way where those connections continue to this day, e even though maybe the entity of Hike for Beer is no more. Oh, it's incredible. We had, I actually saw earlier this month, um, five or six of our members climbed um, Mount Whitney together. And so they were able to go do that. And, you know, it's the tallest peak in the lower 40. I was going to say, that's no small hike. <laughs> no, <laughs> yeah, it's insane. And so a bunch of them went and did it. And, and you know, they brought their cans of beer to the top and cheers. <laughs> and so just seeing those photos and, and really having them, you know, reach out to me and say, oh, we did it. You know, it was amazing to see. And I'm right. glad they're still right. hiking together and, and, you know, hike for beer lives on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I, I know, you know, when sometimes when people ask me, what do I get out of being a coach? And, and, and I think it, it is moments like that where, where, you know, you've played some role in, in, uh, empowering people to be their best, to move in a direction that 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 maybe felt risky at first, to do something new, to step outside of their comfort zone, uh, and the benefits that come into their life from doing that. It it really is. It's it's the payback. I always think for 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 the work that we do. I agree. It's it's really amazing. Like I said, a lot of people we worked with had just moved to San Diego and it was incredible to see, you know, their friend group ended up coming from Hike for Beer. Those were the friends they ended up making right. um and, and and living in San Diego. And and that was something that I that I didn't have when I moved to San Diego. I didn't have a group like that. So to just know that we were that for for somebody and, and a bunch of people right. was just really rewarding. So uh, one could make an argument that entrepreneurship is its own unique brand of, 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 of a helping conversation. So given this first move into being an entrepreneur, 
uh, as you move, uh, you know, as you move away from that and, and are getting into some other things in your life, what would you say were maybe a couple of lessons you learned just from the standpoint of what it means to be an entrepreneur? Oh, so many things. Um, I, I definitely learned that you can never plan too much and coming from an event planner's background, uh, that's something (laughs) that (laughs) is definitely, um, you know, I had, I had a lot of really, I had a a lot of really amazing plans with Hike for Beer and all these things I wanted to do. And I think, um, being adaptable is really something that I learned in being an entrepreneur. I think that you're, you know, you can never plan too much, but also your plans should also be, uh, mold, be able to be molded right. and changed and they're always evolving. And I think that was something I really, uh, learned maybe a little bit the hard way at first and then, um, became a really important lesson. So I think really being adaptable and knowing that your first business plan doesn't necessarily have to be your business plan, you know, down the road. Um, and so that was definitely something that I learned, uh, in the first few years of, of doing hike for beer. And then also really, um, having, uh, having somebody to help with a lot of different aspects of the business as well. I think, um, as an entrepreneur, you kind of assume that you have to do everything at right. first and it's really kind of, you know, this is my business. I need to do everything. But I think as we evolved kind of realizing, okay, I can have somebody help me with, my taxes, somebody help me with, you know, accounting and the numbers and the things that, you know, I don't necessarily have huge talent for. Right. And so um, doing what I love to do and then getting the help that, that I need as well. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. So, so you leave San Diego and you leave San Diego and hike for beer with this idea in your head that maybe checking out the profession of coaching might be the, the, the next the next step. So talk a little bit about that. Yeah. So I, I left San Diego and I moved to the mountains of Asheville, North Carolina, and I promptly actually hired a life coach for myself. Mm -hmm. And, um, and it was one of the best things I think I could have, uh, ever done. I really wanted to hire a coach. So I, I mean, I really was trying to figure out what I was doing, but also to really, um, explore what coaching was like and be sort of in the, in the other seat and, and see, um, you know, kind of, it made me realize that I had been coaching for years really. Um, and with all the things that I've done and sort of, okay, now I see what I've been doing and how can I take this and, and mold it to my own. So I, I worked with my life coach and it was, you know, the most amazing few months really doing a lot of self-discovery, and really kind of putting it into a package of taking all the adventures that I had done and um, really making it so I could present something for myself of coaching, which is, you know, I've had all these adventures. I want to show you how you can have your own adventure and give you the tools to have your own adventure, whether it's traveling to another country or it's going for a hike or it's getting a new job or starting a business. Um, you know, the tools that you're going to use are going to really be based on um you know, what, what's your personality, what your goals are, what your dreams are, and not necessarily have to be this huge, crazy adventure of traveling somewhere. It's really, it's really your own personal adventure. Right, right. So it sounds like in some ways, which, which I always love to hear, (laughs) is that your experience working with a coach, um, while it sounds like it produced maybe some new thoughts and insights, it sounds like it way in, way more was a confirming experience that this direction I've been moving in the way I've been using my inherent skills definitely fits. And now maybe I can just call it coaching. Exactly. It it was really, it was really great. I had a a few aha moments. I had, um, you know, some frustrating moments. I had, you know, all these great sort of insights, but uh, exactly. It was really just confirming Um, I think what I inherently knew all along, but really just wanted to um, put it into words, kind of put it into a a, a package and sort of think about what it was going to look like. Um, And what really helped me the most was, excuse me, working with, um, with my values and really going back to my own personal values. And in my coaching that I've done since then, that's something I really love to work with people on is, is really looking at what do you value the most? Cause I think that's been the most helpful tool to, to me and sort of figuring out my next steps. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. It is, uh, to this day, 
uh, in my work, regardless of client. It, uh, it is one of the conversations we have pretty early on because it, it becomes your roadmap, right? What, what's important to you? What is most meaningful to you? Uh, what does that look like? I, I, I sometimes, I don't know what you've found, but I've often found in doing some values clarification work with people is often one of the really cool outcomes is they walk away from it realizing that there were certain values they thought were really important to them and have found out not necessarily so. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. That and the reverse too is something that they would have never thought uh, anything of. And then they see, you know, sort of a list of, of values and they, they see this value and, oh my gosh, I never even knew that that was something I could value. Right. Um, so it's almost that you see themselves, uh, see people sort of give themselves permission to, to value something as well. Yeah. Yeah. And then, and then jumping on that permission, permission to then act and permission to maybe do something different, um, that will honor, will honor those values or bring those values alive. Yeah. So let me ask you this right now, because, uh, uh, you know, a standard question for me, because one of the hallmarks of, of a helping conversation is to be strength based. So at this point, as you are starting to dig into possibly moving in the direction of coaching, uh, if I had been in a conversation with you at that point and asked you, all right, tell me, Leah Milton, from all of your experience, what are some of your strongest strengths, capacities, positive attributes, gifts to the world that you are realizing have always worked for you and will continue to work for you? Yeah, I think when I was doing a lot of this work, it, it's really it's really the ability to create a connection and create a meaningful connection with somebody. I think that because once you sort of create that connection with somebody, the possibilities are endless and it's really just breaking down those barriers and opening up to being vulnerable, to speaking honestly. So I think being able to really build that honest connection up front is something that I've always uh, been really strong at. And so that moving forward is, is kind of, I think it's, like I said, it's, it's really the most important thing. Once you establish that, you can have, you know, you can talk endlessly about what your goals are, where you want to go, what actions you want to take. So right. I think, um, creating that strong connection up front through, you know, empathy, through listening, through, um, through asking questions and, and through being honestly curious and not yes. judgmental. Yeah. Yeah. I love hearing that because sometimes, uh, uh, when I'm in conversations with, with people about becoming a coach or about coaching, I hear things like this, this, um, perception in their head that, you know, a coach is all about, action and setting goals. And that's all true. But if you don't do that first part that you just talked about, you know, you can send action and goals out the window. Um, so to be able to walk into a room with another human being and, and the first, the first part of the conversation is creating that sense of trust and safety and connection. And that this is a safe space that, that I'm going to help to create as a coach. It's, it's, it's the conversation because nothing else happens if that doesn't happen. I completely agree. And and really, like you mentioned, that safe space, I think, is so important. I think a lot of people um, now, you know, don't have a safe space no. to really talk about it. And, and it's, you know, it's different. It's not, it's, it's, uh, it's different than therapy. And so I think even kind of, you know, clarifying that as well, and sort of this is a different safe space. And right. this is, you know, a safe relationship. We're going to, you know, have that we're going to have some tough conversations, but then, you know, once we establish our connection, like you said, then we can move forward and right. start taking action. And that's the exciting part. Then we can celebrate. And, and I think that's an important part of it as well. Right. Right. You know, it's funny. Uh, last night I was working on something. I'm, I, uh, was interviewed, uh, as a part of a magazine article. And, uh, the interviewer asked me if I could give them some, um, kind of bullet points on how to help people have difficult conversations through the holidays. Uh, and I found myself thinking, because I, I know when I read articles like that, I always feel my back go up. Um, like, I wish it was that simple, right? That we could just find some bullet points and I could walk into my family's house during the holidays and we could talk about these difficult conversations that um, have some significant historical family history to them and just work our way through it versus Hmm, I wonder what it would take for family members to create a level of trust and safety 
that maybe just hasn't been there before. And, and so the complexity of that and the importance of that, it just can't be overemphasized. Uh, you know, that role in our work is helping people. I agree. And I really think it's also not only should it be emphasized, but that it might not take one conversation. It might take two. Right. You know, it really personally, I would rather spend, you know, one or two sessions really getting to know and diving into to where this person is coming from, you know, because like you said, you really can't move forward until you really open up right. um, to that safe space. And so I would much rather put in put in the time and and the effort getting to know this person and, and where they're coming from before we even kind of dive yeah, into yeah. To action. So it might take longer. I, I love hearing that I, in some of the work I do in training coaches and clinicians, that conversation comes up because, as you know, in some corners of the helping world, um, you're, the, the helping person is not given a whole lot of time. They're, they're told you, you need to formulate maybe a diagnosis. You need to come up with a treatment plan. And, and that needs to happen maybe in the first session. And coaching, I, I think if we're doing it right, is, is such a patient conversation that allows for what you just said, that, that maybe by the end of that first 50-minute session, we're not formulating. We're not problem solving. We're, we're not creating goals. We are still in, in the process of of the creation of trust and safety and connecting with this human being. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And, and, and that's something um, I did a little bit of consulting earlier this year. I was um, kind of talking to, I was working for a coach actually, and, and sort of chatting with uh, potential clients before they were coming in the door. And, and, you know, it's really, you know, there is a time frame, and like you mentioned kind of, and a lot of times you're expected to really make those conversations go quickly. And, um, it was during that time that I realized, you know, there's some people that are so quick and really open up really quickly. And then there's other people where you're chatting with them and they might think that they're giving you all the information, but it's kind of like, okay, I feel like you're not really quite opening up right away. You know, let's table this and have another conversation. Right. So it's really having also the, the eye and the ear to know when, you know, they might be telling you a lot of things that are great information to know, but are they really kind of, are we right. really opening up to where we need to be to move forward? Right, right, right. Yeah. So, so talk a little bit now about uh, exactly what you are doing uh, in the world of coaching. Yeah. So I originally back in March, I had a plane ticket booked to go to Nicaragua and <laughs> I was planning on going down to Nicaragua um, and uh, starting uh, sort of looking for, for areas that to, to potentially um, settle down there. Um, my partner and I were looking for, for uh, places where we might potentially be able to have sort of a space where we could host um, adventure retreats mm. and host people to come down to this amazing place and um, get outdoors, go hiking, go in the water, really get some physical activity, and then also kind of um, talk about goals, talk about what, you know, peaks we want to reach and, and so really incorporate travel and coaching. Um, that was the plan in March. And obviously things have changed a little the bit. The universe <laughs> did not cooperate. <laughs> um, so I'm still here in the U.S., but uh, I have been able to spend the last six months really developing the kind of coach that I want to be and looking at who I really want to work with and who I would be most helpful in working with. Mm. Um, and I've, I've, I've sort of formulated, you know, what my practice is going to look like. And it's going to look like I mentioned before, really helping folks um, that are motivated to incorporate adventure into their lives. Um, again, adventure is really, it's subjective. It's, it's whatever um, your own personal adventure is. Um, it's looking at what your goals are. What is that peak that you really want to get to, um, but you're not quite sure of which trail to take. Right. So, um, that is going to be sort of what I'm looking at, whether it's starting a new business. Um, I've been talking with a few folks that are looking at starting small businesses. Um, so kind of looking at getting the tools for moving forward and, and kind of working through some ideas, going from idea to implementation, um, and working with folks on, on really just what kind of jobs they want to get. I have a few friends and a few clients that are looking in the job world right now. And so working with them to figure out using this opportunity, you know, what do I want to do next? Right. Um, whether it's in the job market and then um, just in life in general, I think COVID has given everyone sort of a, a little bit of a wake up call on, on, you know, kind of looking at what, 
what makes you happy? What makes you glow? What do you want to incorporate more into your life? And sort of um, what adventures can I incorporate into right. my life right now being with the limitations we have? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I want to highlight something you said for anyone who's listening, who is maybe thinking about becoming a coach, something you said that is so important, which is that the best coaches don't coach everybody. The best coaches are people who figure out who do I want to work with? Who might I be able to to help the most? And and so in, in the coaching world, they, they talk about creating a niche. Uh, and there's actually a counterintuitiveness to this, that the most successful coaches figure out their niche that brings them joy and they just run with it. Um, and, and so uh, uh, anyone who is thinking about any kind of moving my life forward and thinking about adventure, uh, Leah Milton is uh, is the is the person for you. I, I, you know, I just love what you said about uh, about all of that, because I know everything you just described has been your path to to not follow what some might believe was the prescribed path. And to give yourself permission to think big and what's next and to break out, you know, I think I, I, I own this. You know, I was one of those folks who was raised in a way, and this is not just family of origin. This is larger society of, of pretty clear on what I was supposed to do. And it didn't give me a whole lot of room and permission uh, at certain points in my life to think, well, what would I love to do? That is such, such a powerful message that you are bringing to the folks you work with. It's, it's amazing. And like you said, it's really, it, it's thinking back on, on what I've all been through. And you said sort of that, that you had a lot of people as sort of what you were supposed to do. And I think the root of everything and sort of the reason, you know, for me kind of going off and doing my own thing was I really, um, you know, I didn't know. I, I went to college having no idea really what I wanted to, to be. I when I wanted it, when I grew up, you know, when I, when I grew up, I <laughs> want to be a teacher. I want to be an actor. I want to be a writer. And so I really just didn't have a clear, um, path or idea. So I don't know if that makes it easier or harder really, or, or neither of really kind of being able to go off and, and, and explore. But I think I really didn't, I knew I didn't want to settle on doing something that I, I knew wasn't going to make me happy. And so I really wanted to explore and take a chance to explore. And that's something that I, I want everyone to, to have, to be comfortable having in a safe space to have a chance to explore that really right. what make what brings them joy. Right. I, you know, I don't know. I don't, as you just said, if it, if it was a good thing or a not good thing to not know, <laughs> I, I, you know, I think for me, when I look at some of the statistics about the percentage of people who go off to a job every day that at best they feel ambivalent about at best, I, I, I think this is not a, is it a good or a bad thing? I think it's a reality thing that for whatever reason, many people don't feel at those times in our life, like end of high school, end of college, don't feel like they have permission, for lack of a better word, to think about it for a while, to not make a definitive decision about a specific education direction or occupational direction and go and explore in the myriad of ways you could define the word explore. Because... Statistics would say many, many people wind up in their 30s and 40s in a gig that they are at best ambivalent about. Mm -hmm. And you followed a path yeah. that had a much greater chance that ambivalence was not going to be one of your experiences. <laughs> if it was, it would be temporary. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Um, but yeah, no, that it's definitely something I, I never, even after I left New York, I said, I don't think I can ever, you know, sit in a cubicle ever again. It's just something I don't want to do. And, you know, all the, you know, the few different jobs I had in San Diego, none of them involved a cubicle and, you know, being an entrepreneur, I worked in my kitchen right. <laughs> and so <laughs> coffee shops. <laughs> um, and so really, yeah, wanting to wanting more and really want knowing, uh, giving myself permission to have more and to, to give more joy and have more joy out of, out of what I'm doing. And, um, you know, and it's all also about painting the picture of, you know, it's not, it's not all sunshine. It's not all roses. It's, it's never going to be. And so right. I think that's also important too, because I think a lot of people with social media, with everything in, in, in life in general right now that, you know, we have so much access to the face value of people's lives on social media. And it's, 
you know, this, this person may have a job that they love. It doesn't mean that everything's perfect. You know, that's not as a coach, that's not something that, that, uh, that you're trying to, to say that life is going to be perfect if you, you know, get this one thing. Um, but I think it's, it's really just the opportunity to, to be evolving and constantly strive for new adventures. Right. And, um, and if you're true to your values, then, then you are going to be, to be happy. Happiness is, is within, I know it's cheesy, but it's true. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, not cheesy at all. Very true. <laughs> and, 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 you know, I would agree. I, I, I found as a coach, I think for some, one of the one of the sources of that ambivalence or or even you know lack of happiness has maybe been buying into the narrative that if I find that one thing, it's going to make everything wonderful. And that's as you just said, that's not reality. We all exist in a variety of contexts in our lives, um, and and finding a variety of places where we can find some joy and fulfillment um, is a is a a much better roadmap than believing it's it's going to be one thing. Definitely. I mean, there's, you know, there's only so much we can control, you know, there's, I have so many friends that love their jobs, you know, and the pandemic hit and now there's all these other factors, you know, they had no control over that happening. And (laughs) so, you know, it's, it's really just about give and take and, and, um, and staying true to your values and, and, uh, always striving for, for, you know, being true to yourself and true to your values. So I know you kind of mentioned it a few moments ago, but I'll ask again, uh, for, for our folks who are listening, um, Who's the client? Who's the person that you love working with? I love working with motivated individuals who want to strive for adventure and adventure is what you make of it. But just those who really want to get out of their comfort zone, um, you know, whatever that means to them and really strive to bring joy into their lives through adventure. Beautiful. And if we have some people who are listening who, as I mentioned a moment ago, are maybe thinking about um, becoming a coach or moving into some aspect of of the helping world, uh, at this point in your career, your words of wisdom to that person as they as they maybe get started on this journey, what would they be? To... I definitely recommend to stay, I keep harping on values, but really stay true to your values, true to yourself. Um, There's so much noise out there. Um, There's a lot of people that are going to tell you how to run your practice, who to coach, what to do, when to do it. Um, And and that's the beauty of coaching. It's it's really about who you're helping. And as long as you're helping people and they, you know, and you guys have a great relationship and, and it's moving forward and that's success. I mean, it's really uh, it's so individual, which is the beautiful thing about coaching. Right. And so stay true to what you want to do and and go for it. You know, have that adventure and celebrate with your with your clients as well. That's awesome. Uh, if people are interested in getting in touch with you, Leah, what's the best way for them to do that? Leah.Milton at gmail.com. Beautiful. Beautiful. <laughs> Leah Milton, I cannot tell you how joyful this conversation has been for me on a whole lot of levels. But as I mentioned when we started, having had the opportunity to watch your journey, and as I have shared with you before, um, how much I have admired that uh, and uh, have learned from that uh, as you have moved in all of your different directions. Thank you so much for spending some time with us and sitting in uh, on the helping conversation. Thank you, Keith. It's been a pleasure. It's been great. Thank we will you so pick much this conversation up again. Yes. <laughs> All right. You take care. You too. <laughs> All right, folks. Thank you so much for joining us today for this episode of The Helping Conversation with Coach Leah Milton. Uh, I hope that uh, our conversation uh, has inspired you as much as, as I have said, I have been inspired by watching uh, Leah's journey through the years. And uh, if you are somebody who is looking for a coach, you could not be in better hands uh, than uh, doing some work with Leah, especially for those of you who are out there who are looking to figure out how to bring adventure into your life. Please uh, give her a call. You have been listening to The Helping Conversation. We'll be back with another episode shortly. Everybody, thanks for sitting in with us today and have a great day. So of The Helping Conversation with Coach Leah Milton.
Uh, I hope that uh, our conversation uh, has inspired you as much as, as I have said, I have been inspired by watching uh, Leah's journey through the years. And uh, if you are somebody who is looking for a coach, you could not be in better hands uh, than uh, doing some work with Leah, especially for those of you who are out there who are looking to figure out how to bring adventure into your life. Please uh, give her a call. You have been listening to The Helping Conversation. We'll be back with another episode shortly. Everybody, thanks for sitting in with us today and have a great day. We thank you for sitting in on our discussion today on just one unique version of The Helping Conversation. We would love to hear your thoughts on today's podcast, so we sincerely invite you to follow, rate, and most importantly, review our episodes. For more information on Keith Greer and this podcast, log on to keithgreercoaching.com. Please join us for our next episode as we continue the exploration and celebration of the practice, art, and science of the helping conversation.